the next thing that he indicates to us is that the reference to an interpretant unites directly the manifold of the substance itself. Okay, and this is, all right, well, let's start with the claim. So the claim is that down the bottom, and you've got the reasoning at the top. Let me just read the claim. Thus, the reference to an interpretant arises upon the holding together of diverse impressions, and therefore it does not join a conception to the substance as the other two references do, but unites directly the manifold of the substance itself. It is therefore the last conception in order in passing from being to substance. Okay, so, so he's saying that, <coughs> that the, the, the reference to an interpreter is the last conception, and after that we've got substance, right? And he's saying that it's, it, is, it does that because it doesn't <coughs> hold, um, it, he says it's because it um, unites directly the manifold of the substance itself. It's creating, you've got this manifold and multiplicity of impressions, and it's actually uniting it itself, right? And so, which is to say, it's creating this, this relationship. So let's, l let me read the reasoning here, okay? Reference to an interpreter is rendered possible and justified by that which renders possible and justifies comparison, right? So when you refer to an interpretant, it's justified by the same thing as when you're, when you're referring or, or you're, you're making a comparison, right? The reason for the interpretant is the same as the reason for comparison, but that is clearly the diversity of impressions. So the reason that you make a comparison is because there's lots of things out there and you want to somehow kind of bring some order to those things and you do it through comparison. So, but that is clearly the diversity of impressions. If we had but one impression, it would not require to be reduced to unity and would therefore not need to be thought of as referred to an interpretant. And the conception of reference to an interpretant would not arise. Right? So he said, if there weren't a diversity of impressions, if there was just one impression, we wouldn't need the interpretant. We wouldn't, we wouldn't need to compare. But since there's a manifold of impressions, we have a feeling of, com of complication or confusion, which leads us to differentiate this impression from that and then having been differentiated, they are required to be brought to unity. Now they are not brought to unity until we conceive them together as being ours, that is, until we refer them to a conception as their interpretant. Right? So the reasoning is here is, is, you know, I've laid out the reasoning here. The reason for reference to interpretant is the same as the reason for comparisons, which is the diversity of impressions. So we've got this diversity of impressions that leads us to want to make these comparisons in order to reduce that diversity, in order to bring some order there. This manifold of impressions, this diversity of impressions, leads us to differentiate the different impressions from each other, right? So the, and then bring them to unity. So, so this, this sort of mass of, of this sort of chaotic mass of impressions, we want to bring some order, and we can bring, the only way we can bring order is, is to find some kind of relationships in those impressions, which is comparisons, right? And we can bring them, we can only bring them to unity by conceiving them as being ours, he says, which is to say by understanding them in terms of a particular conception that is their interpretant, right? So um, we've got this multiplicity of conceptions. We want to somehow bring order into them. And the way we can bring order to the, to the, into them is by finding relationships between those impressions. And that gives us a kind of an order. Right? And that creates a, a kind of a unity. Right? By if we can say, okay, of those impressions, we're going to relate this one to this one, and they're linked somehow, that creates a kind of unity. We can only do that if we have some basis for making the comparison. And, and he says that it's, we have to conceive of them as being ours, which is say, there's some, in, in a sense, there's some interest that we have on the basis of which we're going to make the comparison, right? It, 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 we're making it ours. So because different people or different creatures will, will, will split up reality in different ways, right? So you've got this diversity of impressions, like, we, like as Herder explained to us, the, the wolf is going to look at the sheep in a different context that the whatever the male ram is going to look at that sheep right there's th they both have sort of different interests in considering the sheep 
and therefore the sheep is going to be placed into a different set of relationships to other impressions. Right? And so the interpretant that the wolf has for placing the sheep within kind of a relationship to the reality of everything is going to be a different one than the ram is going to have. It, they're going to have two different interpretants. And, and he's saying that you have to have, though, an interpretant in order to establish some kind of relationship between elements in the world, between different impressions. Right? And it's through this process of defining that interpretant, that basis for making a comparison, that this multiplicity of impressions can be brought to any kind of a unity. Right? And so that's why then the, this is the last conception in the movement from being to substance. Because once you've, you've taken impressions and you've established a relationship between different impressions, you're only actually working with impressions and making a relationship between those impressions. So you're already at substance. You're, you're in substance now. And you're creating the relationships within substance. Right? And so that now that we've arrived at that last conception which is substance. Right? So that's why it's the last conception in the movement from being to substance. Right? So <coughs> I'm going to try and, I know it's complicated, <laughs> but I, you, you recognize this slide, this part of the slide. Right? And we're just, I'm just going to try and explain how this interpretant establishes the relationships between impressions. Right? Because, <coughs> because you can have a different interpretant. Because let's say, let's say this murderer Right, so we've got the, uh, we're, we're, we're going to concentrate on this murderer, which is a person who carried out a murder. Right? Now, a few weeks ago, there was this terrorist attack in, in Paris, right, on the Champs Elysees, where there was, a, there was this terrorist who killed a police officer, and there's another police officer that came and killed the terrorist. Right? So if, <coughs> if we're going to consider that police officer that, that, that killed the terrorist, right, and that's the murderer, right, that's this, this police officer that killed the terrorist, he's the murderer, the terrorist was the murdered person. Right? <coughs> The mediating representation is murder, so he's a murderer, right? Because of this mediating representation of murder, but people don't really think of him as a murderer, right? That police officer that killed the terrorist, we think of him as a hero, basically, right? Because he prevented that terrorist from killing other people, right? So he's a hero, but he's only—it's the same person, though, right? And we're defining him in a different way based on a different interpretant, and the different interpretant is this heroic act of you know, killing the terrorist, which is a heroic act now, it's not just a murder, and it's only a heroic act because of that relationship to the saved person, right? Because it, you're not a hero unless you save somebody, right? So, but by killing the terrorist, he saved the other person the terrorist would have or could have killed, right? And so now you're placing that same person, it's the same person, right, in a different set of relationships, and you're defining that same person in a different way through that different set of relationships. So now you've, you've got a, essentially you've kind of got a different kind of reality of the situation. Right? We, know, we don't refer to that police officer as the murderer. No, we refer to that police officer as the hero. Right? And the change, the shift, is created through that shift in interpretant. Right? And so it's the same impressions, it's the same reality, but now we've reinterpreted that reality in a different way to set up a different set of relationships within which to put that same person that we looked at. Right? And so this is the way in which the interpret establishes the relationships between impressions, and it's important which interpret you use. It'll give you a different reality. It'll give you a different conception of the impressions. Right? Finally, and this is the last point I want to make today, the argument I'm going to be making, this argument, actually, one of the main arguments of the course, right, is that <coughs> the related thing, the correlate, the mediating representation or interpretant, and the quality actually match up to what we've been talking about as evidence, claim, reason, and warrant, right? That the, that the related thing is like the evidence, it's like the sign of something. The correlate is the claim, it's the, it's the sign of, it's, it's, it's the, it's a thing that we're, that the, the evidence is signing to, 
right? It's the evidence is a sign of something else, and the claim is then the thing that the evidence is indicating. The reason is the ground of that relationship, the shared quality that both the evidence and the claim have, and the warrant is that interpretant, that mediating representation, right? Just hold that kind of idea without kind of trying to think it through too much, right? Uh, but we'll go through this more. But I just want you to, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. Now that we've got this whole justification for the relationship between relate, correlate, um, interpretant, and quality, that you, you kind of think it through in terms of this other set of relationships that we have that actually, I think, match up, right? And so now we have, in 10 seconds of reading, we've got the whole sequence, right? Being, quality, relation, representation, and substance, right? And so we've completed that whole process that, um, that Peirce wanted to, to lay out for us. And okay, we don't have time for the questions right now, but um, think about those questions if you, we can start with this next time, okay, with the questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs>